Welcome to ATCM, the emergency medicine channel. Yeah. A 64-year-old man presented to the ER with fever since four days associated with body ache, especially back ache. On initial 10-second assessment, airway was patent, no pooling of secretions. Uh, um, on breathing, respiratory rate was 24 per minute, saturation was 97% in room air. <coughs> BP was uh, 130 by 80, pulse rate 82 per minute, uh, all peripheral pulses were uh, palpable. Uh, GCS was you know, E4V5M6, bilateral pupils equally reacting. Temperature was 98 degree Fahrenheit and GRBS was 120 milligram per deciliter. Uh, we had uh, proceeded to uh, adjuncts of, uh, to primary survey. Okay, uh, uh, so just uh, we'll uh, uh, start detecting okay. the history. 64 year old male, okay, have come with fever. Fever and body ache. Fever, body ache since how many days? Four days. Okay, so on assessment A. Uh, was patent. Patent. No pulling of no secretion. Pulling of secretion. Uh, B also. Okay. Bilateral air entry. Uh, equal. equal crepitations. Mild crepitations. Minimal crepitations or bilaterally bilateral, or unilaterally. Bilaterally. bilaterally crepitations are there. Then. Uh, respiratory rate is 24. Respiratory rate is 24. Little bit on the higher side. Then what else he had? Uh, saturation. Saturation was 97 in room. 97 percentage on room air. Mm -hmm. So fever. He never had any cough, breathlessness. No cough he didn't breathless. complain anything. Fever with body ache, especially so, back ache. Especially back ache. Mm -hmm. So that is the complaint that he has. Mm -hmm. And uh, does he have any comorbidities? No, no, no comorbidities. No, no comorbidities. So uh, I wanted to know where he is uh, coming from, which area. Mm -hmm. What is his job so or anything? He's a farmer. He is a farmer. So that is again uh, mm -hmm. uh, one important. He is a farmer, and uh, his job uh, is mm -hmm. very clear now. Uh, four days history of fever, breathlessness. No, no breathlessness, body pain. Okay, you can continue. Yes. So, uh, adjuncts to the primary survey, mm. we did a CBC CRP point of care. Total count was 6.4, mm. uh, hemoglobin 8.2, uh, CRP was 170, and platelet counts 35,000. Okay, okay. Uh, then we did a VBG also. Uh, VBG showed uh, metabolic acidosis, and uh, creatinine was 4.37. Okay. Uh, bilirubin is 7.8, sodium potassium uh, bilirubin is 7.8. Okay, that's again very important. Okay. Uh, and sodium uh, potassium uh, sodium uh, potassium was uh, within normal limit. Okay. Like point, uh, okay. 3.1 was potassium, uh, a little bit low. Uh, potassium was 3.1, sorry, uh, and sodium was uh, 132. Oh, that, okay, so that's it. So we have uh, we'll now we have a little bit of information more. Mm -hmm. uh, so a farmer, so that is very important. A farmer coming to you with fever. Body pain, back pain. Next thing that you have on examination, you had formed jaundice. Yeah, uh, yes. A little bit of jaundice is there. Ictus was present. Then you had bilateral minimal uh, crepitations were there. And uh, you have gotten, uh, why are you not saying it is a pneumonia? Why it can be a pneumonia? Can it be a pneumonia? Yes, it can be pneumonia. Uh, why, why? But I am very sure I am saying it is not a pneumonia. He never had any respiratory symptoms. Mm -hmm. Then you can argue, you can tell me whether it is an atypical pneumonia. Yeah. A typical pneumonia, yes, it can have, but a typical pneumonia presentation, a viral pneumonia can present like this. I am not denying the fact any viral prodromes, you can have fever, body pain, all those things can be there. Maybe breathlessness, they are not noticing it. They don't, but some respiratory, upper respiratory symptoms they used to have, but to start off with or something. But here he never had any respiratory symptoms at all. So that is one thing that we can rule it out as uh, uh, probably we are uh, dealing out a respiratory infection. Then some sort of sepsis is evident, yes. that is for evident with organ dysfunctions. So that is for clear. So what are the organs that is involved? One thing we are very clear, we have a lung involvement, but it is not to that extent, only there is some minimal crepitations are there. Then second one, liver is a there is liver definitely, you have uh, finding jaundice for this patient. Third yes. thing. Kidney, is Kidney involvement is there and fourth one? Sepsis. No, hematological system. system. You have Plate thrombocytopenia is also there. So with this in background, you have probably having a patient with we can easily call it as sepsis. Yes. We can name it as sepsis with organ dysfunction, multi-organ dysfunction. That is what the picture is all about. So were all you can get this sort of a picture specifically from this background uh, what any sepsis can produce this but in particular uh, to this patient uh, with this risk factors and all those things with this risk factors were all you will get is primarily what you have to say is leptospirosis uh, not just leptospirosis he has gone to wheels disease so he has gone into the all the manifestations of the inflammatory phase manifestation of organ dysfunction of all the uh, major organ system we can call it as wheels disease so 
what lab parameters all derangements we can anticipate uh, because of this so why there is an uh, bilateral computation that you are getting because it can be due to ARDS development I will not say it as ARDS as such the patient is going for and probably a leg injury has happened and he might go into an ARDS another common thing the patient can have the patient is supposedly coming and telling hemoptysis you have to think in terms of pulmonary alveolar hemorrhage so that is again one thing important that you need to uh, they will not have any other respiratory maybe they will be tachypneic that is because of the acidosis whatever they are having so metabolic acidosis because of that they can have tachypnea you see in the respiratory rate was 24 what does the blood gas can you read out the blood gas value? Yes, sir. Uh, pH was 7.35. Okay. Uh, PCO to 35. Uh, but bicarbonate was 18.3. So, uh, so, for... VBG. So, okay. VBG is fine. 18 bicarbonate. What is the expected PCO2? 18 into 1.5. 18 into 1.5? Plus 8. So, what is it? 18 into 1.5. 18 into 1.5? Plus 8. 28. And 32. Uh, it's 35. So, what we can say? It's adequately compensated metabolic acidosis this patient is having it is compensated that's why the pH is on the normal side also you are getting the PCO2 is also so 24 is this because of the uh, maintaining of the buffer system so there is bicarbonate loss in order to match that there is carbon dioxide washout so that is the reason why he is having that tachypnea so uh, and maybe acute lung injury is not causing that much amount of tachypnea also we cannot uh, say that it is not primarily due to acute lung injury it can be of both but here when you look at it's adequately compensated and there is no hypoxia as such so uh, what will be the normal uh, for, for example for you when you are uh, what is the trigger for you to have a tachypnea for a normal individual for a normal individual what is our respiratory centers how they have been designed for a normal person sensitive to carbon dioxide we are sensitive more to carbon dioxide but when you compare to copd patient they are more sensitive to oxy hypoxia so basically that is why when in patient coming with copd we are telling don't uh, kill the hypoxia little bit of hypoxia let it be there that is a drive for them to breathe for a normal individual it is a carbon dioxide for an uh, hypoxic for a copd patient they will have this chronic hypercarbia so hypoxia is the drive for them to breathe so with this background you have got a patient uh, we are not very sure because uh, we have got organ dysfunction with sepsis. So like you do for any patient that is coming to ER with sepsis, what are the first three to six things that you need to do in, in this patient also? So can you elaborate? Don't tell me. Don't look at the book. You can tell me. What are the things that you wanted to do? Simple. We started on an antibiotic. Uh, no. Uh, what is the first thing? Measure the lactate. Uh, lactate. That is the first thing. What is the lactate? 1.9 so since lactase is normal it is okay 1.9 means he is going for hyperlactemia about 2 we can call it as hyperlactemia so uh, when there is that also after like 3 4 lactate and all there will be acidosis also lactic acidosis also then why there should be a lactic acidosis for this patient what are the reasons why he can have a lactic acidosis for this patient hypoperfusion like if he goes into shock uh, like might we uh, might anticipate imagine that this patient is not having hypotension no. and his lactate is 6 metabolic acidosis yo that's what what is the reason for lactic acidosis sepsis why sepsis what what will happen in sepsis no uh, i am telling you this patient is having a normal uh, blood pressure but his lactate is 6 reduced clearance okay maybe down the line i'll put that as one but what is the primary reason in sepsis uh, to cause lactic acidosis liver injury, liver injury can uh, again delay the lactate clearance so that can be but it's not in this patient or any patient with sepsis for that matter no what is the mechanism of uh, uh, lactic acidosis in basically in sepsis that mitochondrial dysfunction so that is the mo most important thing the toxin can go and cause destruction of the mitochondria mm -hmm. so that is the one thing lactate doesn't mean that it is due to hypoperfusion it can be due to the direct sepsis the uh, toxins can go and damage the mitochondria and as a result also you can have lactic acidosis so sepsis if it's a plain sepsis one reason can be this and whether it's associated septic shock it can be due to the hypoperfusion and as you said lactate clearance will be delayed so that the lactate buildup will be there for a longer time renal failure is also there this patient has gotten liver failure also so these all those things can attribute to that suppose this patient uh, is again coming which drug that you wanted i am telling you six lactate 
what drug you wanted to check in the drug history. This patient don't have any history. Which drug you wanted to check in for? Metformin. Metformin. Obviously, you have to look for any fenformin. Fenformin is bad. Metformin we need to look. If he is a diabetic, then what are the other drugs that can cause like this doses? That is my question. <laughs> Metformin, you all will say. And again, I will give you a clue. Uh, imagine that uh, this patient, uh, uh, he is taking a drug since last uh, maybe five years. He's taking a drug for five years. And uh, if I give... Okay, then what are the common lithium? Very not very commonly used drug then. This is also not very commonly used drug. So what are the other drugs that can cause lactic acidosis? Gavani, come on. I will give you one more clue. I will go, give you He is on... No, he is on uh, one drug. He is on septran. That is clotrimoxazole. He is taking regularly for prophylaxis. For... It is pneumocystis overishi prophylaxis. That is for why we are giving septran. So who will take septran? HIV patients will take the septran. So what are the drugs? Antiretroviral therapy drugs that again can cause lactic acidosis. So those things you should be very much. You should think about drugs that can cause lactic acidosis. Very important is one ART drugs you have to look for, and one is metformin. Then what other drug? Uh, what can be there? You are giving nebula. Adrenaline is supposed to theoretically cause lactic, increase in lactate, but it's theoretically. So, these are the common drugs that can cause lactic acidosis. So, uh, what are the different types of lactic acidosis? It can be? Ah, uh, that's what? Type A, type B. Type A is because of the hypoxia related mm. causes. Mm. Type B is production metabolite. Okay. So, carbon monoxide poisoning, where will you keep? Carbon monoxide poisoning. It is hypoxia. It is hypoxia related. So suppose there is no hypoxia also, you can still have uh, lactic acidosis. So that's what we were discussing. So uh, uh, one important thing, you said lactate is 1.9. So that's why we got into the discussion of lactic acidosis. So measuring the lactate is very important. So once the lactate is high, what are the things that you will do? Hydrate the patient. You have to hydrate the patient if there is evidence of shock. What, how much hydration you wanted to give in? You said renal failure is there. Uh, you said bilateral capitations are there. So, how much hydration? to give? What is the recommendation? If the patient is in shock or if there is elevated lactate above 4, you have to give 30 ml per kg of fluid bolus for the next. That It's a fluid bolus that you need to give over 3 hours. Okay, That is a very important thing. What people think is that you need to give it aggressively within 1 hour. The fluid resuscitation and sepsis, you have to give it over the next 3 hours. Or if the patient is deteriorating very much faster, then you need not wait and start noradrenaline straight away. So that is another agent. Can noradrenaline cause la increase in lactate? Can noradrenaline cause increase in lactate? It can increase. You are giving noradrenaline for decreasing the lactate, no? <laughs> Technically, when you look into the drug actions as such, if you are giving very, very high doses of noradrenaline, very high dose of noradrenaline rather than the therapeutic doses it can cause. But therapeutically, it should clear the lactate rather than increasing the lactate. So, we have to start noradrenaline. So, we have one step we have done. We have uh, measured the lactate, then hydration if required. The next important thing is what? Draw blood cultures. Draw blood cultures for any sepsis patient. Then only the thing you will come is the broad spectrum antibiotic. So broad spectrum antibiotic, you need to choose accordingly what uh, disease that you wanted to cover. Suppose you are not very sure of what you are planning to treat. Then you can start off with any of the broad spectrum with carbipenem to start off with or maybe a piperacillin tazobactam or any of the broad spectrum antibiotics. So these are the three important, four important things that you need to do in for all patients that is coming with sepsis. So what is meant by uh, refractory septic shock. What is the terminology? Refractory septic shock. What is the uh, government? Even after 24 hours with... No, no, I will not wait for 24 hours. You should have a consensus for this. Two supports, one support, 24 hours. So there is a clear definition for a refractory septic shock. When the patient had hypotension, he had given initial fluid resuscitation. Still there is hypotension. You are given your first vasopressor agent and still there is persistence of hypotension. You will call it as a refractory septic shock. And what is the thing? Why, why I am asking about refractory septic shock? You need to start a second inotrope or a vasopressor agent. And that is the time that you have to think in terms of giving what? 
steroids steroids so refractory septic shock is the time that you need to think of okay whether there is some adrenal suppression that is happening to the patient because of the sepsis the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis can be deranged and no need to take a serum cortisol level in this group of patient so that is only when you are suspecting in significant adrenal issues then you can send for for patient with sepsis there all the cardiac rhythm everything is altered so no need to take an random cortisol you can just give them which drug you will choose you said steroids why hydrocortisone why not dexamethasone so menylocortic reaction so two drugs that has been recommended at one is hydrocortisone and fludricortisone so whichever has got maximum water retention menylocortic reaction we should need to choose so uh, when you come to dexamethasone it has got less but it has got very good anti inflammatory property so and methylprednisolone it has got very good anti inflammatory property but water retention is best for hydrocortisone and fludricortisone so that is the time when you have to think refractory septic shock so refractory septic shock 50 my m uh, 50 mg q6 hourly 200 mg that again one of the commonest doubt in a clinician's mind whether we need to taper the sense stop steroids whenever you are starting for steroids that is a common doubt in your mind whether should we should taper always remember for such situation once the sepsis is stopped you can just stop the steroid no need of tapering so like 5 days and all you can just give this and you can just stop abruptly there is no problem so that is one and when who all should receiving a tapering dose whenever you are giving a steroid for more than 2 weeks time whenever you are continuously using steroid for more than 2 weeks time then only you need tapering dose otherwise you need not do a tapering suppose somebody is coming with acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma one week you are giving the monen uh, steroids you can just stop them so were conditions where you want to continue maybe tuberculous meningitis where you are treating it for a longer time maybe the conditions like rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune condition where we are you going to use it for a longer time you need after 2 weeks only you need to, that's why you can just abruptly stop the steroid there is no issues so that is the next thing so that is regarding refractory septic shock then what all things you need to uh, uh, what have been done to this patient now we have an uh, gentleman who has come with uh, fever body pain and he is being a farmer he said we will think of leptospirosis so leptospirosis how will you treat leptospirosis or wheels disease for this patient how we have treated you can tell so no we had uh, initially like we started him on doxycycline okay doxycycline 100 mg bd but uh, also we have started him on peptas since he had been referred uh, like from a hospital so we also gave a good gram negative uh, coverage and then uh, so that will not be the main reason why you would have started on peptas and desovectum i was thinking of other sepsis also uh, during yes, that time yes, once the patient diagnosed. is diagnosed for leptospirosis mm -hmm. you can stop everything and you need know, doxycycline you write antibiotics the leptospira will die so yes. that much fragile organism is it mm. so you give any antibiotic that micro organ the organism will die so once we are thinking uh, in terms of it can be uh, we don't know whether it can be gram negative septicemia it can be a gram negative septicemia we are not very sure it can be urinary tract infection can have the sepsis also can have similar presentation so sepsis leptospira will present like this but any other sepsis imagine that he has got an acute renal failure because of an uti pyelonephritis mm. then also he can have organ dysfunction then also he can have acute lung injury then also he can have thrombocytopenia so this is one close mimic is leptospira very commonly seen in our uh, uh, region so tropical fevers tropical fever leptospiras we consider uh, will not you suspected dengue fever also for this patient so what are the things that is against dengue what are the things that is positive for dengue so uh, in dengue the jaundice and the Um, renal involvement would not be so common. Jaundice will be there. Jaundice, be there. Uh, yeah, jaundice you will get. You will get OTPT elevation, uh, and you can have a little bit of hyperbilirubinia and all. But uh, you will not get like uh, renal failure. Not very common in dengue. So when you are seeing renal failure, that is more in terms of uh, uh, leptospirosis and uh, lung involvement. Conjunctive also you will have. You will insufficient cell. Everything you will have. You can have subconjunctive. Suppose imagine that this patient has thirty-five thousand count and he had a bad sneeze. Just when he can have a subconjunctive hemorrhage, so which can just look like an uh, muddy conjunctiva and after that. So again, lung involvement is also not very common in dengue. But dengue they can present with uh, something very severe that is HLH. Um, uh, uh, 
macrophage activation syndrome sort of a picture where you can have very high bilirubins you can have like 16 18 bilirubins otpt very high so all those things can also be present but liver failure uh, will be there but uh, you have to but never a uh, renal and uh, lung involvement is rare unless and until the patient has gone into hemorrhagic fever and all he can have similarly like pulmonary alveolar hemorrhage and maybe secondary to some other reason he, the patient can develop renal failure but that is rare in dengue but that is how you have to differentiate so you said you have started him on piprasin lisobactam and doxycycline now uh, we had a suspicion of leptospira so how did you proceed uh, with uh, diagnosis of leptospira so uh, this patient is four days uh, so how will you proceed so we, for the first week so we'll send uh PCR, uh, okay. PCR for leptospira. Mm. We can also do urine uh, for dark field microscopy. Mm. But we have, now we have done for PCR. Why urine dark field microscopy is not done? Why urine field dark field? You have to run to the lab with the urine sample. You have to run to the lab and dark field microscopy should be available. Within short span of time, that urine sample should be evaluated for a spirochete. By the time it will die, we will not be able to see. So that is why it is not a preferred investigation. So now everywhere you ask, PCR has come. So you can do PCR testing for uh, leptospira. So the initial, uh, maybe early phase itself, within one, two, three days, the PCR will be positive. And uh, uh, what will be the other test? After one week's time, you can go for the IgM, but never in the first week. Only after first week, you need to go for IgM. Uh, so uh, that is how we have to diagnose. Can we culture uh, leptospira? Normal blood culture, they won't grow, but they have to specifically ask for a different medium, EMJH medium, I don't remember the exact name. So that is the long back microbiology knowledge what I am telling. EMJH medium is what they will use it for uh, growing micro, uh, the sleptospira. Uh, so that's it. So how will be the patient, how the patient can, uh, whether how will improve or deteriorate, whether you need to give steroids to this patient? Any role for steroids? Mm -hmm. oh, can be given, yeah. cannot be given, you should not do. Ah, Roll of steroids. So if yes, like where that. you have to give. I have told you septic shock. Refractory septic shock, definitely it is indicated. Where all you can try steroids or you can be given as per your uh, terminology. See, uh, when in an early phase, there has been a little bit of studies, early phase of acute lung injuries, mm -hmm. There has been found to be some effectiveness of giving, like in your ARDS, early phase, inflammatory phase you can give, no, not after the patient is going for a full flown ARDS or something, but before that, that inflammatory phase, there might be some benefit, there might be, but still there are not very good clarity on this, but routinely steroids are not recommended. Uh, unless and until you have some other pressing indications like refractory septic shock, maybe a wheeze associated with it, whether your normal liberalization is not working, at that time you can start. But otherwise there is no asset, but vasculitic phase, there is a role, but we don't know when that phase is exactly going to happen. So to time it, maybe the first 48 to 78 hours, 72 hours will be the timing uh, where those phase will happen and maybe you can give a shot of steroid or any steroid for that matter which has got very good anti-inflammatory property. So that is the thing that you need to remember. And how the patient usually progress? Wheels disease. It is one of the diseases that has got very bad mortality rate. If it is not recognized and not been treated and the, already the complication develops, it is a, it has got, got very bad mortality rate. So the most important, what are the treatment aspects other than it is supportive, definitely it is supportive. Most importantly, this group of patients, they have got acute renal failure. Okay, it is acute renal failure. As you said, it is acute tubular necrosis. But the problem is that it is pretty fast that will happen. So what will happen is that their acidosis and all, they will start deteriorating very quickly and even like 12 hours or 24 hours of oliguria, this patient can go into significant volume overload and the patient can have further worsening of acidosis and maybe sudden cardiac arrest can happen. So what, what we had seen, this group of patients should be dialyzed much earlier much earlier we should not wait especially leptospirosis uh, don't uh, give a trial of all these drugs uh, by lasix you see the output give bicarbonate infusion to avoid dialysis they should be taken for dialysis the creatinine value is irrespective of here creatinine value don't look at the creatinine value it is acute renal failure it is acute renal failure output acidosis hyperkalemia once it starts settling in do not hesitate that patient should be dialyzed immediately whether he was dialyzed 
So this patient did not require. The patient didn't require dialysis because his urine output was therapy. preserved. So that is what even if it's 4.8 creatine, we didn't dialyze. But some patient even 2 creatine, we want to dialyze. It all depends upon the urine output. Since he didn't go for a shock phase, he never had any anuria or oliguria. Phase didn't happen to him. So one important thing that you need to keep in mind is dialysis. Don't ever because this is uh, what are the clues that you will have to dial severe acidosis the patient is pain the compensated the ph is dropping do not wait call the nephrologist and push them for dialysis immediately and if you are not dialysing the next day you are going to see is him in cardiac arrest so that is very very thing one most important thing regarding leptospirosis you have to pressurize for dialysis and get the acid base disorder corrected as quickly as first that rules hold for all, but in leptospira, what we had seen, they will come if you are not dialyzing it due to some reasons, the patient will do that has been uh, because nobody will tell to you indirectly because they don't want to give a negative data to you. So that is how no studies will be telling this. So definitely the mortality, when you look at the mortality of leptospira, when you review it back long back when we had sort of patient, we used to review them back, why they are dying, that, that's what you have to have an early dialysis. Don't look at the parameters as such, onuria and oliguria on start settling in, acidosis start settling, immediately you dialyze this group of patients. That. What are the other possible? Then what's worst possibility is pulmonary alveolar hemorrhage. Once pulmonary alveolar hemorrhage develops, it's pretty difficult to save the patient. So that is again one of the poor prognostic indicator when you see a patient with leptospirosis. So uh, when you ask me to intubate a patient with leptospira, the my deadliest thing is that whether the patient will bleed or not. The patient bleeds, so that intubation has to be that smooth as much as possible. You have to do RSI with all your sedation agents, proper RSI has to be done. And unless and until the patient is not been done, you can have pulmonary alveolar hemorrhage and it has got very bad mortality also when the patient goes in pulmonary alveolar hemorrhage. <laughs> then the next thing is renal failure. What is the usual pattern for any ATN? Like 48 to 78 hours, it will worsen. And after that, you will, uh, acidosis will take a little bit of time, but the urine output will start improving. Then they will go for something called as a polyuric phase. So when initially you might have hyperkalemia, but later on you will have hypokalemia because of the fluid loss that is happening uh, to the patient. So that is regarding renal failure and all other creatine, uh, sorry, uh, the platelet and all it will start improving. Very rarely we need to do transfusion unless and until you have got a pretty less than 20,000 uh, platelet count or any hemorrhagic manifestation, we need not transfuse. Uh, so usually that once you give antibiotics and all, the uh, problem is that the leptospira will hit and it will go out. So 48 to 78 hours, you are not treating it, the patient is going to be in complications. So you have to treat it and uh, usually like three to four days, you are handling them well, they will recover. So uh, he has gone with wheels disease, maybe leptospirosis as such when you can think, they can just come up with just fever and thrombocytopenia. Mm. Renal failure, mild renal failures and all. So that group of patient, they might recover much more faster. But this patient will take more time. So uh, once it is proven that uh, it is uh, leptospira, no need to continue any other antibiotic. Just doxycycline will be more than enough or even crystalline penicillin. So these are the two recommended agents that has been uh, hired for. So how is the patient right now? So the patient is improving. The patient is improving. Okay. So anything else you want to add on for leptospirosis? So this is true for all your tropical fever, any sepsis patient, you will be treating the same way only. You will be treating with a broad spectrum antibiotic and you have renal failure, you will be dialyzing. But leptospira as such per se, these are the problems that we need to anticipate. Okay, fine. Thank you.